It's my nerd world and Depeche Mode, the podcast. On this week's episode, is Memento Mori a goth album? Going to talk a little bit about that. The history of In Your Room from a fantastic Depeche Mode website. Another song has been added to the tour as it continues across Europe and your listener feedback this week. Hello, this is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. Hi, this is Dave Garn from Depeche Mode, and you are listening to My Nerd Road. Welcome to it. I'm your host, John Justice, here to talk about Depeche Mode again this week. I hope you are having a good one. I have not bored of Memento Mori. And I've said this on many of the podcasts since the album's release, but this album just does not have any burn for me. And I did not stick with the last couple of albums the way that I've stuck with Memento Mori. And a few weeks ago, I did a podcast, and I was talking a bit about sort of the the modern aspect of the album combined with the organics and something about my commentary just wasn't sitting well with me between now and when I finally landed on something heading in to do this week's show. And I remember even doing that particular episode, I felt like I was struggling to articulate exactly what I was trying to say about what makes Memento Mori unique. Now, I think it's different for everybody. I often say that music and art and movies, it's all subjective. I would love to hear your further thoughts on Memento Mori as we revisit it now that it's been released for a while. And so many of you have already gone and seen the songs that have been performed uh, live. We have a little bit more in terms of visuals for the album with the videos for Wagging Tongue and and Ghosts Again. Ghosts Again, again, a song that does not burn for me at all. None of this album does. This week, though, I was, <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, I, I think I may have talked about this in the past, maybe I haven't, but I do this thing, and you're probably, you're probably going to, it's probably going to sound like I'm crazy, and so, uh, Matt, please don't re- con- consider um, our seeing the show together in November, um, and don't think that I'm nuts, but I've always done this thing with Depeche Mode, where I've envisioned visuals or videos to go along with songs that didn't already have videos attached to them. As if if I were going to create a video for Depeche Mode, what would that what would that be? And I've done this since you know I first discovered the the band as um, probably getting into Violator and Songs of Faith and Devotion back when videos were becoming more prominent at the time. One that I'd been stuck on since Memento Mori was released was what I would do for Don't Say You Love Me. I adore that song. I, I really it, – it's really – it is Fighting With Ghosts Again um, as my favorite song from the album. And both of those tracks are really high up on my list of all-time favorite songs. I'm going to talk a little bit about In Your Room and the history of uh, In Your Room from Almost Predictable Almost one dot blogspot, which is a fantastic website. You can follow them on Twitter at Almost Predictable Almost. Uh, but they – have been going through the singles, and they had recently a post on the website talking about In Your Room. In Your Room is also a song that I absolutely love. I I just, I love um, the thematics of it, how epic that song sounds, and Don't Say You Love Me has a very similar, just encompassing, emotional, cinematic vibe to it, and I've been thinking for a long time, ever since I've heard the song, like if I was going to create a video for this song, what would it what would it be? And we got the tease at the end of the Wagging Tongue video that potentially we may get a video for uh, Don't Say You Love Me. Maybe it'll be another single. I hope so. I hope we get some remix of it that aren't dance remix that are something that are a little bit more akin to a restructuring of the of the song. But either way, I finally landed on something. Because I was struggling in my mind to come up with what visuals I would want to put with the album. And I'd always had sort of a, a, a large Victorian castle in mind. Something dark and foreboding. But in terms of the characters in the song, what dynamic would they be in? And I finally landed on it the other day. And the thought was, and again, you're going to think I'm crazy. Well, the thought was, 
as I was thinking about in the in the in a video, who would be singing the lyrics? And initially, I had this idea of of a man singing this to a woman, and he was the one in the vulnerable position. So singing the lyrics to this person um, who he was struggling with and telling her, don't say you love me. It wasn't quite working for me, and then I figured it out. Almost to the point of it being a duet of two individuals walking through this large, dark, either castle or a Victorian mansion, singing back and forth the lyrics to each other. Maybe alluding to them even being vampires and perhaps they've been shut from society and they only have each other and they've been struggling with uh, with each other and their emotions and love for for decades. And finally, I was like, oh, man, this would be really, really interesting. And then it hit me. I said, man, I would love to give it this really the vampire aspect of it made me think I would love to give it this goth vibe. And that got me thinking, is Memento Mori a goth album? We don't really hear much about goth anymore. In terms of trends among young people, I I don't know. I certainly don't see, as I did when I was younger. Um, then again, I'm not around groups of young teens uh, often enough to know if this is even a thing anymore, or if it's morphed into something something different, if goth is now called something else than what it was called when we would traditionally think of goth. You know, going back to the 80s and 90s, when I think of goth, I think of The Cure and Sisters of Mercy and Bauhaus and Peter Murphy to a lesser extent with his solo work, Susie and the Banshees, a Joy Division to a certain extent. Depeche Mode's in that category, but it's not... I never really went all in thinking Depeche Mode as being a goth doing that thing with my fingers, air quotes, band. They certainly had their black period, and it certainly became a staple of the black swarm, certainly around black celebration. But, you know, even, and then, you know, Martin's wanting to wear leather, and at the point in time leading into the, um, the promotion of music for the masses, you know, black leather was a part of their wardrobe. But it wasn't, you know, I, I mean, apart from Martin in those years that I'm speaking of, taking on a goth aesthetic, I mean, the rest of the band really didn't, apart from wearing dark clothing. Memento Mori, though, the more I started thinking about this, I began to realize maybe that is what I was trying to, the point I was trying to get across in that episode a few weeks ago in talking about sort of the postmodern technology, organics, electronics. So I want to ask you, because I haven't really quite landed on it. I feel like that's part of what makes this album special. Maybe it's not in the traditional sense of what you and I are used to in terms of goth. I don't see anybody going to the latest tour, um, you know, decked out in black eyeliner and black fingernails and, you know, and wearing dark clothing and and draping themselves in the goth aesthetic. But when I think about the album itself and the songs and the vibe the songs give across, I, and, and certainly the visual, I mean, the visuals lean into it. Let me frame it this way. If Memento Mori had been released, with everything that we have around the promotion of the album, right? The artwork and, and you know, just the, the, the album is what it is. If this had come out during the time period in the 80s going into the 90s when the goth trend was probably at its height. And I may have missed a a moment in time and era where goth was came back into prominence. I'm just going back to my own youth. If Memento Mori was released back then, would fans look at this album? Would it put Depeche Mode into the category of goth more so than they were at the time. I personally feel like that's a part of the aesthetic of the album and its promotion and its artwork that makes it special. Maybe it's not a traditional goth album, but the elements that would draw me as a fan to Susie and the Banshees, Bauhaus, The Cure, Sisters of Mercy. I feel like this album encompasses those aspects of goth in a way that certainly the albums after say songs of faith and devotion didn't as you know didn't encompass as much the theme the, the themes are always there 
But even that changed quite a bit. I mean, you get into sort of sounds of the universe and you have um, a a brighter, more optimistic outlook. The song and the way that that uh, the way the production is on sounds of the universe is certainly um, bright by comparison and optimistic more so than the previous albums. You know, albums after that, they're diving more into sort of a cross electronic and blues aspect that people have talked about so often. Um, I wouldn't put Spirit in a goth category by any extent. Perhaps the only album that I would even point to that I would even think was leaning into anything goth related would be Delta Machine. But again, that kind of goes back to the blues aspect and the tour and the visuals and Anton Corbin's pictures that he took for the the um the liner notes of them down in in New Orleans you know that always kind of carries New or- you know New Orleans always kind of carries that vampire goth vibe so i'm just curious what you think um this album is just amazing but is it a goth masterpiece do you think it falls into that category at all or am I just crazy and I should spend less time um, fantasizing about creating videos for uh, Depeche Mode songs that don't have uh, that don't have videos? It's okay if you want to tell me that too. I'm perfectly. I've been called worse things. Uh, Talkshownerd at gmail dot com or uh, leave me a uh, message on YouTube and I'm happy to share it with you uh, and uh, share my comments on next on uh, next week's show. All right, so the tour continues across Europe. As I mentioned last week, new tour dates uh, have uh, been uh, have been announced. Love following individuals on uh, Twitter and uh, seeing their comments and the photos. Some really interesting uh, behind-the-scenes uh, videos have popped up on Twitter as well uh, over the course of the past few days. And just I'm just dying to see this show live. And the reviews continue to just absolutely rave about these about this tour. Uh, Martin Gore added But Not Tonight back into his list of solo songs. More recently, he added in Strange Love, But Not Tonight is a much better pick. I echo the sentiments of a lot of other people, though, where I wish that they would do a full album version. I know they're not going to, but I, I, I would love a full album version, band, all the band together, doing But Not, uh, but not Tonight with Dave singing. Historically... It's been noted that the band spent all of their production time on Stripped to be a single and spent like a day on But Not Tonight. And we're very annoyed when that became um, one that the record label picked to promote in America over Stripped, which they had spent so much time with. Stripped certainly comes off like a goth song, right? Getting back to that again. I'm probably crazy. I look forward to hearing from you. Make me feel better. Or tell me I'm completely wrong. I don't care. Um, the version that Martin Gore does of But Not Tonight acoustically is um, is really good, and I enjoy it. There was a remix that came out a while ago where they took the live version that Martin did acoustically of But Not Tonight and they put it to a full, a fully produced music bed behind it. And I, I don't know. I, and I think I've got it in my iPhone somewhere. It's so good, though. So, so good. But again, I just I wish we could get a fully live produced version of that song with Dave uh, with Dave singing but I would take a um a Martin solo of that I certainly would do it over home I love home it was the song that my wife and I first danced to when we got married uh but I would take um but not tonight over home um uh if I were having to choose or if I had that option almost predictable almost one dot blog spot uh, fantastic website. Follow them. Almost predictable. Almost on Twitter. Uh, they've been covering the details of the singles up on their blog. And I wanted to share with you some notes from In Your Room. This was a really special release for me personally when it came out because I love that song. I didn't really realize until I read some of the notes of uh, what they posted on Almost Predictable Almost that this would be the last single release with Alan Wilder which makes it even uh, more special uh, in my uh, in my opinion. So I'm not going to share with you the entirety of the post. I just wanted to share with you some of the notes. I thought it was interesting, and I thought you might like to know a little bit of the history of this single from 
Songs of Faith and Devotion. In Your Room, Bong 24, released January 10th of 1994. It was released on three CD singles and cassette originally, with the first CD and cassette on the 10th of January, and the next two CD singles a week later. This was one of the things that I thought was really special about this particular release, was the staggering of the discs that went into this gatefold that ended up folding out to make a crucifix. I have it. I'm looking at it right now through the glass in my desk where I keep all my Depeche Mode uh, CDs, and it's one of my prized possessions. And I remember how excited I was the following week to go to the import shop to get the two CDs that came out and the fact that we got extra sleeves that they came in. I just thought it was all cool. Um, As with all the Depeche Mode physical releases, I was so into just getting my hands on all the physical stuff. And unlike what they've been doing now back then, we got all this really cool, unique artwork for everything. I know for budget purposes, that's why we don't anymore, but I really wish we did, especially with Memento Mori. The rear of the promotional postcard explains all. The single was given a few enthusiastic reviews, though not by Dave Morrison in Select Magazine, who wrote, There are three CDs worth of mixes and live versions of stuff making up In Your Room by Depeche Mode. All of this released separately over a period of weeks. Why? To keep it in the charts? Shame on me for being so cynical. The mode may have some Dorian Gray-style pact that means they improve with age, but unless you've more money than sense, don't buy it all. Go for the Butch Vig mix. Of course, the Butch Vig mix would be the one, the Zephyr mix, which they ended up playing live on several of the tours. In Music Week, Alan Jones was more complimentary, giving the song Single of the Week, saying, Less obviously a rock record than some of their recent releases, the new Depeche Mode single is a fairly dark, but nevertheless quite commercial record in which, I think my voice squeaked there a little bit, that was weird, Um, (laughs) nevertheless quite a commercial record in which some dense guitar work is punctuated by a pleasant chorus. The fact that it is spread over three CDs will help it to achieve a chart placing above and beyond what could have otherwise be expected, so reaching the top ten is a real possibility. Now, he wasn't wrong. The song entered the UK charts at number 18 and then soared to the top ten at number nine the following week. It didn't cling long, however, and then fell to 28, and much to to the disappointment of fans of numbers with eight in them, it ended its chart run at 56. There was, of course, no Top of the Pops appearance here or in any other country on Earth, and even though it quite clearly only happened because of the three-CD single trick, In Your Room became the third of four Songs of Faith and Devotion singles to chart in the UK Top 10, the band's highest ever singles per album success rate. Then he shows some pictures of the CD and what it looks like. It features four tracks of the Zephyr mix, the extended Zephyr mix, which really sadly does just what you think it does. And then, thank God, two live tracks. Never Let Me Down Again and Death's Door from the 29th of July 1993 gig in France. Both are great. Um, The LCD Bong 24 that followed a week later, and it gave us four more live tracks and a wonderful sleeve. From the same gig as the CD twenty uh, CD Bong 24 tracks, we got In Your Room, Policy of Truth, and the staggering devotional version of World in My Eyes, and a glorious fly on the windscreen. I listened to this CD endlessly. XL CD Bong 24 arrived the same day. It contained two remixes of In Your Room, the Jeep Rock Mix by Johnny Dollar, and Porta's Head, and the uh, the Apex mix by Brian Eno. Both are great. It also contains the Adrenaline mix of Higher Love, which is not so great. Yeah, that's a weird version. It, I mean, it's, I would still take the Adrenaline mix of Higher Love with what they did over what we are getting now in terms of these dance remixes. They obviously took all the soul and emotion out of the song, but did what I like when remixers do, and that is they kept the... the the vocals intact so you still have an intact song within this um it's a different mix it's paced a lot faster in terms of the beats um but certainly uh nowhere near uh, does it reach the heights of um of what the original one uh did uh and again this is for higher love i may have misspoke there but this is the adrenaline mix of higher love 
And what do you get if you put them all together? Voila, you get the Trifold Crucifix Pack that features a drawing of either Dave or a mushroom with legs. It's c- clearly Dave. Uh, presuming it's Dave, it is. CD Bong 24 is his torso and shoulders. LCD Bong 24 is his right hand. And XL, uh, XL CD Bong is his left hand, which is disconcertingly much higher than his right. <laughs> I imagine uh, your big CD Bong 24 box is just like mine falling apart. Mine's actually in pretty decent shape. Um, It certainly has its wear and tear on it, but thankfully it hasn't completely fallen apart. Not exactly built to last, but a novel thing and just about as mad as everything else in Depeche Mode's world was at that point in time. And it was just... um, as I've, you know, I'm repeating myself once again, but it really just was such a special time around the release of that uh, of that album. But it was the combination of all of it. I still remember the 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 conflict that I had, and conflicts is conflict is probably not the not the best word to use. But when having gone through the period of promotion of Violator. And looking at the time frame, you're looking at like a year and a half later, right? I mean, it just seems like nothing. Can you imagine getting an album within the time span between 88 and 93, getting music for the masses, Violator, and Songs of Faith and Devotion in that time period when we had to wait six years to get Memento Mori? I mean, it's been so long since we got albums that close together. At the time, it felt like six years, right? Just time moves slowly. We get into habits as we get older, and time just flies by. You know, I just, weeks feel like months, months turn into, oh, no, I know, I'm getting the lyric wrong, right? I should start <laughs> quoting comeback. Weeks turn into months, months turn into years, or whatever. You know what I'm driving at. But when Songs of Faith and Devotion came out, right, having no idea what to expect, right? no internet, Really no previews. I've told the story about going to uh, Hyde Park Corner, getting the ma- getting the magazine and seeing Dave with tats and long hair and a goatee and going, what is going on? Getting the single for I Feel You in My Hands and looking at the artwork, which was such a juxtaposition from, from the rose, the clean, crisp font used for for violator beyond the handwritten violator itself but the the way the font looked for depeche mode itself and just seeing this you know anton corbin written almost scribble of depeche mode with the uh, with gray with these blue lines and it just all had this raw feel to it it seemed so different and so conflicting and then hearing i feel you for the first time with the squeal and getting into the song and just kind of going oh my gosh this is nothing like Violator, finding it appealing, but still sort of struggling with this is Depeche Mode, and then just falling in love with it, sort of allowing, you know, my allowing myself to accept that. All right, we're not getting Violator Part Two. We're getting something very different, something that I'm not used to, something that I didn't know I was going to love. I just and it was just an amazing time, and then just embracing it, getting into the devotional era. Of uh, of the band, um, and again, this time around, Memento Mori is one of the closest that I've felt that way since since then. Right, so all right, <laughs> I'm just kind of meandering here now. Let's get to a little bit of of, uh, of listener <laughs> listener feedback <laughs> this week. I just tra- I'm just trailing off. I just love this band so much, and it just it brings me so much. So much joy, and if um, you hadn't figured it out yet, I love reminiscing um, about it. I uh, just, just this this band just means so much to me in my life. Michael writes in well anxiously after learning of and scrolling through the announced dates of the early 2024 leg. I admit to feeling the disappointment of the absence of any Southern Hemisphere shows. Let's face it. In the time since DM last came to Australia, some fans' cities will be having their 12th or 15th concert over 7 or 10 different tour legs. But I've come to the conclusion that the band owe me nothing, and I'm just grateful for the music that they've created over the years, including up to some of the new Wagging Tongue remixes. So, given life is fleeting and I have time and means, I've now booked flights and picked up tickets to see them at the end of October at Madison Square Garden in New York. Good for you. 
I've also tacked on a side trip to see you too at the Sphere in Vegas. Have you seen the images of the Sphere in Vegas? I don't know how that's legal. It looks so distracting. It looks incredible. I don't recall you two. I, I'm kidding about it being legal. But if you've seen the giant sphere where they're going to be performing in Vegas, and you just you see the the video screens on the outside of it, it just looks unreal. And I love what you two said about this venue. Is that typically when a band goes on tour, they go to these stadiums and these places where they go and play are not built for these big stadium shows. They built the sphere, the sphere specifically for this type of music experience. He says, I don't recall you 2 and Depeche Mode touring the same country at the same time before, but maybe they have, and I suppose it could be expected given the remarkable similarities in the album release timeframes over their, over their careers. But all, up, um, but all up an opportunity too good to miss. And I now have no expectations. If they ever uh, come to Australia, well, that will be icing on the cake. Cheers, and thanks again for the podcast, John. Michael, I wonder if I speculated last week that after this, uh, I guess, fourth leg, right, that they've added of European shows that maybe they would come back to America, perhaps they'll end up visiting the Southern Hemisphere and they just haven't announced it yet. Maybe that's part of the plan. Maybe they're going to stick on that side of the globe in Europe. And then the next announcement going into the second half of 2024 will actually be for the Southern Hemisphere and not the U.S., considering they are coming back for a second leg here in the U.S. very soon. So maybe that's the case. I have a hard time thinking that after the speculation that's come out of them going down to Australia and the region, that they won't be coming there. But that remains to be uh, seen. So hopefully they will for those fans down there. All right, that wraps up the show for this week. I smell dinner upstairs. <laughs> I was in a good mood today, can you tell? Thank you so much for checking out the episode. As always, if you want to support my nerd world and you happen to read science fiction, head on over to Amazon.com or MyNerdWorld.net and you can pick up my science fiction space opera series, Embark. Seven books in all in the series, written for adults, but great for ages 11 plus. You can follow a ragtag squadron of pilots and one reluctant hero who just happens to be a massive fan, a fan of Depeche Mode in the year 2172 as they fight for survival across the stars and their future. Head on over to MyNerdWorld.net or Amazon.com, and you can purchase paperbacks from me directly. If you're interested in purchasing any of the books in the seven-book series, which is available in hardcover, paperback, and audiobook, also ebook, you can purchase paperbacks directly from me at a slightly discounted rate as it pertains to shipping. Just drop me an email, talkshownerd at gmail.com. Let me know which book you want, how you want it signed, and I'll give you the details on how you can uh, pay for it and I will ship it to you within that week. All right, I'm back next week. I look forward to hearing from you. Am I crazy? Is Memento Mori a goth album? Talkshownerd at gmail.com. Until that time, I hope wherever you are, you are happy, you're healthy, and you're safe. I'll talk to you then. Bye. Hello, this is Martin Gordon.